As sex workers, femmes, women, and queer folks, we're so often led to believe that we're not good enough or that we should be ashamed of who we are. Almost all of us know what it's like to have our wisdom, perspectives, and ideas dismissed. In our personal and public lives, many of us know how it feels to be routinely misunderstood, overlooked, sexualized, or a combination of all three. Stigma and systemic oppression make it harder than it should be for us to lead normal lives. We're often pressured to prove our worth in our careers, in our creative endeavors, and even in our closest relationships. The irony is that in general, sex workers are some of the coolest, smartest, funniest people you'll ever meet. My name's Lila. I'm a stripper, writer, musician, and anti-misogyny educator. I'm Erica, a body justice educator, pole dancer, tarot reader, and webcam model. And we, and we are a Stripper's Guide podcast. On this show, we combine our special areas of expertise to bridge the gap between the sex worker community and everyone else. We cover everything from intimate relationships and abuse recovery to gender politics and body justice and the larger social systems that make life so much harder than it needs to be for sex workers and people of marginalized genders. We do tackle some heady topics on this podcast, but don't worry. We also know how to keep you entertained. We are strippers after all. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of a Stripper's Guide podcast. I'm your host, Erica. And today we're going to be talking about desirability politics, the Queen of Wands, and the Queen of Cups. This episode is going to be a little bit different from our other Terror infused episodes. Not only are we talking about two different cards instead of just one um, as the guiding, guiding light for our topic, but we're going to be using the Minor Arcana versus the Major Arcana. What is the difference between the two of them? The Major Arcana is what we've been pulling from in the previous Tarot Infused episodes. They're the Fool's Journey. Whereas the Minor Arcana, much like, you know, playing cards, there are four different suits in Tarot. But in Tarot, each suit represents a different element. So we have the Swords, that represents air which is symbolic of your thoughts, your mindset, perception, things of that nature. Think very mental. We have wands, which we're going to be talking about Queen of Wands, so kind of tuck this in the back of your mind for a second. Wands are fire, and they symbolize your passion, creativity, drive, anything that moves you forward. Much like fire moves forward. Cups represents water. And it symbolizes your interior world. So emotions, intuition, psychic, things of that nature. And finally, we have the pentacles. That represents earth. It's our material, physical world. Things that take time to build and create. Things you can see and feel. Now the queen in these decks. Well, the royalty in these decks in general represent two things. And I'm thinking primarily of the king and the queen. The king is authority over external action. So if we think king of wands, for example, we're thinking external authority over your passion, your creativity. Whereas the queen is more inner authority. So having mastery kind of over yourself and your inner world. So if we think about the queen of wands and the queen of cups respectively, it is inner authority over your passions and inner authority over your emotions. Sorry, I just had an ADD moment where I was like, which one did I say first? Queen of Wands, passions. Queen of Cups, emotions. And like I said, there is a king in all of these suits. And that's external authority. But when we think about authority, I kind of want us to not think about authority 
in the kind of patriarchal sense that we've been indoctrinated with where <clears throat> authority kind of equals brute force. It equals crushing your emotions to say, to give this illusion that you have control over them or using your passions only to create money for yourself. Mm -mm. I want us to really picture having inner authority. It is an intrinsic thing. It's an internal thing. It's not something that we snuff out or crush or dominate. It's something that we acknowledge, that we see, and that we create boundaries and structures for, for them. For them to thrive, for them to grow, for them to just even exist. Now that we've established all of that, what does that have to do with desirability politics? As someone who is a fat femme and a sex worker, I've noticed people in other marginalized groups as well. We don't necessarily get encouraged to have inner authority. We don't, we aren't told that we are allowed to have boundaries. We aren't really shown what that looks like in media. What is shown to us is if you're a fat person and a sex worker, if someone has a romantic interest in you, it's more than likely like some kind of joke or someone is hoping they will change that facet of you. And speaking for myself personally, I have run into many partners, many sexual partners when I disclose this information, disclose that I am a sex worker, that I'm a webcam girl, they, in their minds, there's an automatic link between my job and between myself as a person and between kind of how ready I am to have sex. And... It doesn't allow for any nuance. It doesn't take any consideration for me as a person. This is like one of the times I'm like, separate the art from the artist. This is one of the only times. <laughs> that if you are with a sex worker, they are not their job. They are not the character that they have created to make money, to remain safe, to separate themselves from their job. Sex is already hard enough. We have to be vulnerable. We have to trust another person. To add in that extra layer of this person no longer sees me as me, the sexual being. They see my job, the sexual being, and equate it as such is a real blow. Because then you don't even know if they're actually interested in you or if they think you could do some outlandish shit during sex. And I don't know what that outlandish shit is, but it, it just feels like that expectation is now there that you did not ask for, that someone is just assuming. And I mentioned as a fat femme, we are also not really encouraged to have boundaries for ourselves, inner authority for ourselves in sexual situations. It's kind of like the idea that, and I hate to put it this way, but it is like the insidious implicit message that I've received in a lot of my dating life that I had to like, take a step back from and reject it. But the idea that we should be kind of grateful for whoever is going to be interested in us because the further me message of that is 
because we are fat, because we have larger bodies, that we do not meet some type of beauty standard. And accordingly, not as many people are going to be interested in us. So it's kind of this idea of you should be able to take what you can get. And when you're in that situation, the f- more underlying message of that is what is the point of even having boundaries or standards or an idea of what you want if the game is already rigged against you? It took about 14 years of really living that message, both of those messages, that one, as a sex worker, I am my job, and so I should act accordingly, basically never breaking character. And two, as a fat femme, the statistics are not in my favor, so I should settle for whatever I should get. Excuse me. And all that really did, it didn't make me feel desired. It didn't make me feel cared for. It didn't make me feel affirmed in any way. It really just left me feeling like I was always having to put up a mask and it's exhausting. And I fell into some really bad situations because I did not have any structures in place. I didn't I didn't think I could ask for what I really wanted sexually. Let's just put aside romantically, like even sexually, I just felt like I had no agency. I felt like I was kind of just there bopping along a spectator in my own interactions, which is also kind of an exhausting feeling because you're like, what am I even doing here? And maybe some of y'all have felt like that too if you're in these marginalized groups. Maybe this is something you've moved past, but you still feel like a twinge of regret for ever feeling that way. And I'm just here to say like, we've been fed these messages For so much of the 90s and the aughts, even the 10s, and I I would even say now, like, you still see shades of it. People try to be, like, more conscious of it, but we live under capitalism. It's kind of like all you, it's all about what you can produce. And what's the saying? You're only as good as your last paycheck. And, you know, people aren't. In marginalized identities, we fall outside of that in some way, shape, or form. So there's always going to be a shade of judgment and some type of messaging against us and against our agency. Because we're antithetical to capitalism. I can see the word in my head. I've never had to say it out loud until just now. So if I said it wrong, oh well. But yes, if you've internalized it and lived it and you're trying to break free of it or you've broken free of it and you feel kind of guilty for ever feeling that way, it's truly not your fault. The messaging was given to you and forced down your throat. It's hard to know when that's all you're he- when that's all you hear that it's something that you're supposed to resist. So what do we do now that we have that information, that we have that percolating in our brain, and we're thinking about the Queen of Wands, and we're thinking about the Queen of Cups? The Queen of Wands asks us to know, to really know what sets our soul on fire how we want to create, how we want to move, how we want to live passionately. 
without letting that fire burn too bright, without letting it consume ourselves and others. So for me, that's really meant that I don't really have to let the feeling of being desired be all consuming to lead me into sexual encounters that I don't even want to be in. <laughs> I've let the idea that I kind of the message, like I am finally being desired. So I should just go with whatever. I have definitely let that consume me before. And it's led me to unsatisfying sex sex with men that I am not attracted to. <laughs> that feels like the biggest sticking point to me. <laughs> to doing things that I'm like not super cool with. Like either I'm very neutral about it or I am somewhat uncomfortable with it, but I don't say anything because I'm like, well, at least, at least I'm here. The Queen of Wands has really led me to name what I want sexually what I want to inflame my passion basically like what turns me on what makes me attracted to someone and stick to those standards not even just boundaries just stick to those standards that is like the bare minimum of structure that I could give myself when it comes to sex just, just what am I attracted to what am I looking for in a partner what am I looking for in casual sex? What kind of person do I want to be with, even if it's going to be for like an hour or two? Bare minimum. Bare minimum structure. But it feels kind of revolutionary because it's contrary to what we've been told. And what do we do with the Queen of Cups in desirability politics? What do we do when we're told our emotions are secondary? That we're told that we're basically a prop to usually cis hat white men in their hero's journey. First things first. We take our queen of wands, we take our standards. And we create boundaries for what we want in sex. We center our pleasure. We center our standards. And we don't settle for anything less. And even if it's just going to be for an hour or two, we deserve to genuinely feel desired, to desire the person we're going to be with, and to have pleasure from sexual encounters. This is not something that we should kind of feel like, I'm just glad to be here. No. We are here to experience joy, to experience pleasure, to experience like the highs of what life has to offer us. And for us to settle, we're cheating ourselves out of those feelings. And we should be setting up our before care. So that's our standards. That's our boundaries. That's naming what we want and centering our pleasure first. Our during care. So cool. We got it. We centered it. We're feeling it. Having a good time, hopefully. In our aftercare, what do you need in the aftermath of these situations? Do you need to never talk to the person again and be like, thank you for, it was a nice time. Thank you. I never want to see you again. That's fine. Do you need to cuddle afterwards? Do you need to set yourself up with some Gatorade, a glass of water, whatever, like whatever you need to feel like safe afterwards? What do you need? Name those needs. Name, create the things that are going to make you feel safe. 
create the atmospheres, the environments that are going to make you feel truly desired. Not ones where you kind of just feel like you're a spectator in your own interactions. The Queen of Wands and the Queen of Cups are asking you to tap in to what you want. Tap into things that are going to make you thrive. Tap into structures and routines that are going to make you feel safe. And for desirability politics, they're going to ask you to tap into experiences in having standards and finding people that are going to center your pleasure first, that are going to allow you to do that. And situations that will make you feel emotionally safe. So I want y'all to ask yourself, does this help me thrive? Does this center my pleasure? How can I create more pleasure for myself? Does this make me feel safe? And if any of those close-ended questions, if any of those are no Move on to the next. Because we are not just here to be props. We're not here to be a character. We're here to like enjoy ourselves. If we are creating the environments where we feel truly desired, even if we're the only one there for a little bit, I promise it's much better than feeling like a spectator. In your own sexual interactions. That's all I have for y'all right now. If you like this episode, please share with your friends. Share on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you share. You can find us on Instagram at a stripper's guide podcast. If you like what I particularly said in this episode, you can find me on Substack Revolutionary Hotness. I also have my Instagram link below, and I look forward to seeing y'all in our next episode.